I'm Caitlin. I'm one of the R3s. I'm in the primary care track in the HIV pathway. And next year I'll be doing an adolescent medicine fellowship. And one of my interests is um, uh, sexual health. And so today I am going to talk to you about how to counsel about certain safe se sex practices that are maybe kind of one step further than, than what you have been taught in the past. Um, all right. So no disclosures. Um, as we often say before these talks, like I'm not an expert on any of this. I just wanted to become a better resource for my patients, which is why I created this talk. I'm hoping that by the end of this, you know, 40 minutes or so that you will be able to understand some common terms that are used by patients to describe some of their sexual practices that you'll feel more comfortable asking patients some detailed questions about their sexual history and that you'll feel more comfortable than counseling patients on how to reduce their risk while having sex. Just some guidelines. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some uh, things that make you may make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Some of them make me uncomfortable, um, but at the end of the day, um, some of your patients may be participating in some of the things that I'm gonna talk about. And, um, you know, everyone has different preferences when it comes to sex. And I think that the more that we can enter these conversations uh, without judgment, the more our patients are going to trust us to share some of those things with us. So if it makes you feel uncomfortable, just like kind of sit with that for a little bit. Um, and, um, you know, hopefully uh, you'll feel a little less awkward about it by by the end of my talk. So, uh in terms of kind of safer sex 101, I think what we tend to learn um, when talking about safer sex or like how to counsel patients is that people should limit their number of partners, that they should always wear condoms, they should get tested for STIs regularly, and if they're at higher risk, they should get tested more for STIs. But I really think that this is kind of the tip of the iceberg in terms of counseling patients on how to be safer. And um, so I'm hoping to kind of chip away at some other parts of the iceberg today. I'm coming at this from the perspective of harm reduction. This is often talked about in the setting of illicit drug use, but we actually do this in a lot of different areas. So for example, driving a car is the most dangerous thing you can do in a day, but we don't you know, stop people from driving cars. We just set speed limits, have people wear seatbelts, put in airbags, things like that. And so that's where I'm coming from today. We're not going to tell people not to do these things. We're just going to to uh, counsel them on how to make it safer. So here's my outline for today. We're going to talk about lots of spicy topics. And I'm going to start with personal lubricant. And we'll jump into this with a case if, um, and I'll have a, a question here. So you're seeing a 45-year-old transgender man for his annual physical. You're about to see a lot of annual physicals. Um, he uh, is on testosterone therapy. He is married to a cisgender woman and they use toys for sex, including dildos and vibrators. And he uses his vagina for sex. You ask if he has any concerns, if he enjoys sex, and he's like, well, you know, we've been using these water-based lubricants, but I have been feeling really irritated uh, afterwards. And so I'm wondering like, if there's something else that I can use. So this is gonna be kind of a multiple answer question um, if the poll works, but which of the following would you discuss with him as an alternative to the water-based lubricant he's using? Your options are saliva, a different water-based lubricant if he hasn't used it already, baby oil, coconut oil, olive oil, or a silicone lubricant. And you can choose as many as you would like. I wish I could see like how many people have answered. I'll give you like five more seconds. All right. <laughs> um, 
So we got uh, quite the spread here, more votes for alternative water-based lubricant, coconut oil, and silicone. Great. So these are the ones um, that I would choose to talk about, and I'll go through kind of each of them. So there are many different options when it comes to personal lubricant. Um, anything from um, saliva to kind of specially formulated products that are marketed as uh, personal lubricants. So saliva, it's free, it's accessible, uh, can be used with latex, can be used with silicone. Um, however, it is not very slippery, uh, it dries quickly, and it is a potential um, kind of uh, way to spread infection. And so that, that is one of the risks. There's also uh, petroleum or kind of non-natural oil-based products, really Vaseline and baby oil are the only ones in this category. A lot of people have these in their homes. Uh, they're pretty cheap um, and people already have them in their home, it's, it's accessible. However, it can break down latex. So if patients are using latex condoms, they should not use any petroleum or oil-based product because it'll, it'll um, increase the risk of, um, of the condom breaking. It can also stain fabric and it can cause vaginal irritation, which is why I would not recommend it for this patient. The next uh, group are plant-based oils. So uh, this can include cooking oils like coconut oil, olive oil, or especially formulated products that use a plant-based oil as its base. Pros to this also, you know, a lot of people already have these oils in their house. Uh, they are um, relatively inexpensive if, if people are getting like a coconut oil or something. Um, has kind of Multiple purposes can be used as a massage oil if patients are doing that during their like foreplay. It's safe to eat if they're also having oral sex, and it may be a little bit better for sensitive skin. However, cannot be used with latex, but is safe for silicone. It can stain fabric, and then in the case of cooking oils, it can become rancid. So I would talk to um, this particular patient about using a plant-based oil since um, you know, he's not using latex uh, condoms. There are latex toys out there, but um, they're not as common. Um, and if he's got some sensitive skin, you know, maybe coconut oil wor will work a little better for him or even olive oil. Uh, next group of uh, personal lubricants are water-based lubricants. I include all these pictures just to make the point that there are many, many products out there. Um, you know, they are, there are flavored uh, versions, there are kind of uh, water-based lubricants that are kind of marketed as more natural, um, but there's a wide variety of ingredients in all of these different lubricants. Um, there's also a wide variety of volumes. Um, apparently you can get a 275 gallon vat <laughs> of lubricant on Amazon. Um, which I discovered there was like a TikTok that came up. I guess they have some like really funny pictures that are like advertising this like giant vat of lube. But anyway, lots of different options. Uh, some pros for this uh, uh, are that they uh, water-based lubricants are latex and silicone friendly. Some are flavored for oral sex if uh, people want to use that. And they're safe for both the vagina and the anus if people are, you know, having both vaginal and anal sex. However, certain ingredients may be irritating for sensitive skin and, um, and it can dry up a little bit more quickly. But given that there's um, such a variety in products, I think it is worth asking this patient, like, have you tried a couple different products um, and um, just trying to see like what works best for him. And then the last category is silicone lubricants. Uh, lots of different products available in this category as well. Some are more expensive than others. Um, they can be used in water if patients are like having sex in the shower or in a hot tub. Um, it is latex friendly, so can be used with condoms. And the, the other pro is that it stays slippery longer, so it doesn't dry up as fast. Uh, however, it cannot be used with silicone toys. So for our patient who's primarily using toys for sex, um, I wouldn't recommend it for him. 
toys are made out of a variety of uh, different, um, you know, materials. There's glass, metal, uh, silicone, and so you could clarify that with him a little bit more. But um, but if he's primarily using uh, silicone toys, I wouldn't recommend it. It's kind of a like dissolves like situation. It can break down the silicone of the toy and make it kind of a, um, harder to clean and things like that. It can also stain fabric. And if patients are using it in the shower, it can make the surfaces slippery. So like a fall hazard there. So that's something um, that you also may wanna talk about. Um, and if you wanna screenshot this or look it up later, it's from the American Sexual Health Association. It just um, kind of summarizes everything. You could throw it in an ABS or just use it as a reference, um, but also easy to find on the internet. All right, next I'm gonna talk about condoms and we have another case. So you got another yearly physical and your patient is a 22 year old cisgender man. He is in your, uh, sorry, you're asking him about his sexual history and he tells you, you know, I just got out of a long-term relationship, um, haven't had sex, you know, started having sex again, but thinking about it. He has sex with cisgender men and he describes himself as verse or versatile, meaning he has both insertive and receptive anal sex, or he both tops and bottoms. He, uh, you ask him how often he wears condoms and he's like, you know, I've never worn condoms before. I'm allergic to latex, so I just, I just don't do it. And he tells you that he uses coconut oil primarily for lubricant. So you ask him like, are you willing to talk about other types of condoms? And he's like, yeah, sure. Like, you know, let me know, you know, what I can try. So which of the following condoms would you recommend? Would you recommend a polyurethane condom, polyisoprene condom, lambskin, or would you tell them to just suck it up and use the latex condom? And maybe we'll get the poll. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, hopefully we have enough answers there. If we can stop the poll. Can I stop the poll? I don't know. I don't know how this works. All right, also got a good spread here, but I see more votes for polyurethane condoms, which is great because that is also what I would recommend. So many different types of condoms. Uh, most common is latex. It's inexpensive, it's accessible, it's sold in gas stations, grocery stores, um, pretty easy to access. However, there are a decent uh, amount of people with allergies to latex, and so that is one barrier. It can degrade in high heat, so if patients are keeping them in like a wallet or if they leave them in a hot car, it can break down the latex and make them break more easily. And as we discussed before, cannot be used with oil-based lubricant. Polyurethane, all the, all the other ones can be used in the setting of latex allergy. Um, polyurethane condoms are safe with oil-based lubricant, which is why I would choose that for this patient who prefers coconut oil as a lubricant. If he's willing to try different um, lubricants, then you can recommend other things, but, um, but that's what I'd recommend given, given what he's told us. The drawback of polyurethane is that it's not as stretchy as latex. So if there's not a good fit, it can either break more easily or fall off. Polyisoprene is more stretchy like latex. So the fit issue isn't, uh, isn't as big of a deal. It also degrades in high heat and also cannot be used with oil-based lubricant. Um, so, you know, if he's willing to switch the lubricant he's using, he could use a polyisoprene condom. And then finally, lambskin uh, apparently feels more natural. However, it does not protect against sexually transmitted infections and only protects against pregnancy. So for this patient who's not worried about pregnancy and is um, uh, primarily protecting against STIs, then, um, then uh, lambskin wouldn't be a good option for him. Lily, I don't know exactly what temperature the latex breaks down at, um, but, uh, you know, generally you should tell people not to like carry it around in their wallet if like their wallet's against their, like, is in their back pocket, because, um, 
yeah, it can, it can cause it to break down, but I don't know the like specific details. Um, and just thinking about like cost to patients when you're recommending these things, latex uh, is the cheapest and lambskin, uh, like these are all Walgreens prices and it's like $5 a condom. So just know what, uh, what this is going to cost patients when you're talking to them about it. Any other questions before we move on to the next topic? Cool. Next, we're going to talk about anal intercourse. I'm going to give some historical contract, uh, context. Anal intercourse has been around since the beginning of time. Um, there are many ancient artifacts uh, throughout the world that uh, have depictions of um, anal sex. Uh, in around like 500 AD, the word sodomy began being used and kind of around the same time laws banning sodomy um, started kind of showing up in history. And then during medieval times, um, sodomy was increasingly kind of associated with hereditism, Satanism, uh, things like that. And anti-sodomy laws um, have uh, historically been used to punish same-sex sexual behavior, particularly among men. Um, in the U.S., uh, anti-sodomy laws have been around basically since colonial times, and in some areas were still enforced until the Supreme Court ruled them unconstitutional in 2003. I kind of wanted to look at, like, you know, the, the prevalence of anal sex because, you know, I work in Madison Clinic and, you know, I see a lot of um, men who have sex with men. And so um, uh, for me, like, I just, like all my patients are having uh, anal intercourse. And so I wanted to, to get some better numbers. So there's two studies. One is um, the CDC, which looks at kind of um, annually, uh, like asks about if, if people have had anal sex um, or um, condomless anal sex in the last year, but they're looking at a um, very uh, specific population um, of like people who are at higher risk of HIV. And then there's also an, uh, there was a national survey that was done that asked about lifetime um, part like participation in anal sex. And so these are the numbers you can see that among um, men who have sex with men, I also recognize these are very limited gendered terms. It's just kind of who was studied. Um, but in men who have sex with men, and uh, the majority of um, people surveyed reported that they did have anal sex in the last year, but much fewer reported that they had had condomless anal sex in the last year. Uh, and among cisgender women, about a third um, from this national survey reported that they had ever had anal sex, and about a quarter um, reported uh, on the CDC survey that they had had anal intercourse in the previous year. Um, but uh, many of, of the women who reported having anal sex also reported having condomless anal intercourse. Uh, it's, it's important to know, you know, if patients are having receptive anal intercourse because there's a much higher risk of HIV transmission and STI transmission. There's a number of reasons for this. When comparing to the vaginal mucosa, um, the rectal mucosa has much lower immune protection. And so when comparing to receptive vaginal sex, um, that's one of the reasons why there's a higher rate of, of HIV transmission. And the rectal mucosa is also more susceptible to abrasions. Um, and so if patients are having receptive anal sex, um, you may think about just doing some extra counseling around prevention of um, STIs and HIV. Um, one thing to also be aware of is there may be a higher risk of fecal incontinence with receptive anal intercourse. There's kind of mixed data on this. There are some small studies that showed no association. There were a couple larger studies, which, you know, I've kind of crammed a bunch of text in here, but some larger studies that did show an association between, you know, rates of fecal incontinence and reported receptive anal intercourse. Um, but there also was this very large study in France that looked at um, 21,000 men who have sex with men, uh, and they only found a positive association um, with frequent receptive anal intercourse, kind of harder practices like 
anal fisting or BDSM practices or using drugs during sex. Um, so, you know, it may be something that you think about if you have a patient who is coming to you reporting fecal incontinence, you may want to think about asking them about their sexual history as well. One common practice among people who are frequently participating in receptive anal intercourse is uh, rectal douching. The purpose of this is to kind of reduce the amount of feces that is present during, uh, during the sexual act. Um, it's been studied more in um, MSM than in women. Um, and there's kind of a lot of information, like lay information out there on the internet about kind of like how to do this. And I'll show you some examples later. In terms of the studies that have been done, um, again, mostly studied in MSM. Um, typically, uh, people who do this uh, are using kind of homemade solutions like tap water, water with soap or water with salt. However, there are commercially available products like saline, sodium phosphate, mineral oil that people use as well. There actually have been studies where they gave a bunch of volunteers um, like enemas, and then they went in and took biopsies of the colon to see which ones were the most irritating to the mucosa. And they found that uh, hypoosmolar solutions like tap water and soap sud enemas were much more irritating than the isoosmolar solutions that they were studying. For example, polyethylene glycol, which is actually not available over the counter as an enema solution. Um, and there have been a number of other studies showing that isoosmolar solutions are, are safer. We just don't have them readily available. Um, so a isotonic solution is probably going to be the best um, to prevent some irritation, which may also increase risk of uh, HIV transmission. A lot more data uh, is needed to kind of look at, at safety, uh, but I think one interesting area of research is looking at uh, microbicidal uh, enemas to try to prevent HIV transmission. So we'll see where that goes. Um, some other safety tips are, um, you know, recommending that patients limit rectal douching to two or three days per week to try to prevent kind of that recurrent irritation. They should make sure that the water is not too hot. There are some people who use like hoses that are attached to their shower. And so um, using that may increase the risk of using water that's too hot. And it can also increase the risk that they would use too much water. And so they should just be really careful about not using too much. And these are some examples of what's available on the internet. Uh, I guess the, the first one is from the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. There's this um, thing called Douchey's Guide to Butt Health, and it's like very tongue in cheek. They have actually like a lot of great information on there. So if you like don't want to talk about it with your patients, you could just like send them to this website um, it has like fun cartoons and stuff. And then there's this one, which is called How to Clean Your Ass. Um, and it's like this, uh, like, you know, cartoon instruction manual on like how to use an enema. Um, and it's very silly and uh, actually is like decent advice. So um, just to let you know what's out there. So just to wrap up kind of counseling about anal sex. Um, just know that it's commonly practiced, uh, not only uh, among men with sex with men, but also, you know, cisgender women, transgender men, like lots of people are out there having anal sex. And so don't just assume that that your patient is not doing it. You can tell patients that the rectum does not create its own lubricant. And so ad adequate lubrication is really important to kind of prevent some of those abrasions that, that may occur. The rectal mucosa is really delicate. So People should take things slow. It can increase the risk of STIs, including HIV. So can consider, you know, doing more counseling about condoms, prep, things like that. And if your patient has a vagina, they should know that moving a penis from the anus to the vagina can cause infections. And so that should be avoided. And if using erectile douche, um, try to use normal saline and don't do it too often. Any questions about that before I move on? Thank you, Lily, for clarifying the uh, heat stability of latex. It was not something I thought to look up. All right, our next fun topic is toys. 
So this is not going to be a poll, but um, but you're seeing a non-binary patient uh, after they were seen in the emergency department uh, because they were unable to remove a penile ring at home. They used a stiff metal ring and it got cut off in the emergency department. Luckily, there was no strangulation injury and he's healing, or sorry, they're healing really well. However, they don't remember receiving any counseling in the ED and they want to know, like, what should I do in the future? So a little bit about penile rings. There are many different terms that you may hear to describe penile rings. And the way that they work is by restricting blood flow at the base of the penis, and that can help maintain erection. It can come in a wide variety of forms, uh, may be made from silicone, leather, metal, uh, and may include additional bells and whistles like vibrators, anal plugs, rings for the testicles, um, things like that. So here are some examples. Uh, we got um, our penile rings with vibrators at the top left. Um, next is an example of one with rings for the testicles to the far, <laughs> not literally bells and whistles. I'm Maybe, I don't know. Um, the sex toy industry is vast, so I'm sure there's something out there with literal bells and whistles. Um, one on the top right uh, is adjustable. And then at the bottom left, we have two metal non-adjustable rings. And then this uh, last one at the bottom right um, has an anal plug attached to it. So there are pros and cons to penile rings. Um, you may actually think about recommending these for some of your patients who experience premature ejaculation, although we don't have great data on whether or not it works, um, or for erectile dysfunction. There's also some data on um, vacuum devices being used for erectile dysfunction. And so using both the vacuum device and a penile ring may actually be helpful for, for patients with erectile dysfunction, especially if they don't want to take medications or they have some contraindications to like PDE5 inhibitors. There are some risks, however. For example, uh, there's a small risk of entrapment or strangulation injury if patients like our case uh, are using a metal ring. And it can cause skin breakdown if worn for too long. I actually was recently scheduled uh, to see someone in Madison Clinic who didn't show up, but I was reading through his notes and saw that he had actually had this issue because he used meth before sex. He had sex for a very long time and didn't take the ring off and so had some skin breakdown. Um, if you look at like WebMD and like very uh, various web pages talking about penile rings, they'll always recommend that patients talk to their doctor if they have diabetes or take blood thinners. I couldn't find any evidence um, around this, but um, I guess theoretically it could lead to some like greater risk of microvascular injury or bru bruising, things like that. Um, so, um, you know, may just let your patients know if they have any of these comorbidities that they should just be careful. So to summarize counseling about penile rings, patients should use rings that are adjustable or made of an easily removable material like silicone instead of metal. They should put the ring on when the penis is flaccid or semi-erect and it shouldn't hurt. So if it hurts, they should remove it immediately. And they should avoid using it for more than 20 or 30 minutes. They're planning on using meth during sex or planning on having sex for a long time. They should just not, not use the ring. And strangulation is a urologic emergency. So if the ring gets stuck, the patient should just go to the ER right away. Um, they can keep taking, like trying to take it off on the way to the ER, but, um, but they should just go to the ER, even if it feels a little embarrassing. Um, oh, I see, oh, STIs. Oh, Lauren, such a great question because I had a bunch of slides about that, um, but I took them out because I had like 80 slides. Um, so the short answer is that, um, as Ruth said, I usually just say like, look, we're going to swab all three sites. Um, CDC recommends that for men of sex with men, you swab where they're having sex. The Madison Clinic, we typically just swab it all. In cisgender women, hasn't been studied in transgender men, but in cisgender women um, who are having sex with, who are having receptive anal, or sorry, who, let me back up. In cisgender women, it is recommended regardless of whether they're having anal sex to swab at um, all three sites because cisgender women can still get 
rectal chlamydia and gonorrhea, even if they're not having anal sex. The holes are really close. Things can go between them. And so I, I would recommend um, swabbing all of the areas just so you don't miss infections. You can kind of look at the patient in front of you and decide whether that makes sense, but um, but it is recommended to, to swab both the rectum and either get a urine sample or swab the vagina. So that's my short answer. Um, cool. When I post my slides, I'll like put all of them in so you can see all of them. All right. So next I'm going to talk about anal sex toys. I'm not going to like spend too much time on this, but, um, uh, there's a lot of toys out there. Uh, and here are some examples of the types of toys that you can look at, uh, later. But the greatest risk of anal sex toys is that they can get lost in the rectum or the colon. And a lot of toys that are um, manufactured specifically for use with anal sex have a flared base to them so that they do not get lost. And if patients are using objects that were not made to be used as sex toys, which may be done for a number of reasons, sex toys are expensive. Um, and there's a lot of stigma around kind of anal sex and using, you know, anal sex toys. And so they may not want to keep something around that, you know, can be identified as, a, as an anal sex toy. And so they may use kind of objects that were not made for that purpose. But the risk of using something without a flared base or something that's breakable is that it can get lost or it can break inside the rectum. And, you know, this is a common problem. Uh, there's a study that showed that in the UK, around 400 foreign bodies are removed from rectums every year. That may include things like drugs that are hidden in the rectum, but um, but it's, it's happening frequently. So if a patient tells you that they're using anal sex toys, again, you know, similar to anal sex, they should use plenty of lubrication. They should use toys with a flared base, and if they use anything else, it may get lost. They shouldn't use anything uh, that's breakable or that may cause abrasions in the rectum. And again, moving toys from the rectum to the vagina can cause um, infections. And so they should clean it thoroughly or uh, use a condom that you take off. And if a toy gets lost, go to the ER right away. It's not going to come out. So just like go to the ER because uh, some of these have to get removed surgically because people are like waiting around for them to like come out with a bowel movement and like uh, they just don't and so I don't know what the data is but um but they should just go to the ER and have it removed any other questions with that oh Ruth said uses a wrench or other thing hmm. oh nice thanks Ruth I've never seen one in the ED I mean I've seen it like on the track shell but I've never seen it myself so all right, next we're gonna talk about drugs during sex and we have a case with a pole. Um, and it's A through D if that's helpful, Jabal. Um, So you're seeing a 55 year old cisgender male patient who has a history of type two diabetes and hypertension. And he wants to talk to you about erectile dysfunction. He is having a really hard time achieving and maintaining erections even with masturbation and is not consistently having morning erections any longer. A friend gave him some Viagra once. He liked what happened, and so he wants a prescription. He has sex with men and has both receptive and insertive anal sex. So what recreational drugs should you ask him about when you were counseling about safe use of PDE5 inhibitors? Meth, marijuana, poppers, or cocaine? All right, I think that's probably a good amount of time for the poll. Can we stop the poll, Jabelle? Cool, another mix here, awesome. Um, so, I, I mean, you should always ask your patients like what drugs are using, but in particular, I would ask about poppers. 
We don't know what poppers are. Um, they refer to inhaled amyl nitrites, and they are commonly used prior to receptive anal intercourse. So after inhaling the poppers, there is a release of nitric oxide and that leads to vasodilation and muscle relaxation. And so it's used to cause relaxation of the anal sphincter, which can make inter, uh, anal intercourse easier and more pleasurable. And it can be also used in non-sexual contexts uh, because it can cause this like euphoric head rush. And so it can be used in like club settings, even, even without um, kind of like planned anal intercourse. However, there are some risks. Uh, they're not regulated by the FDA. They're easy to buy online or at convenience stores. They're often marketed as room deodorizers. But when they're used in combination with other vasodilators, such as PDE5 inhibitors, they can cause severe vasodilation, which can result in loss of consciousness or ischemic injury, such as heart attack or stroke. And there are some case reports of some other adverse events such as met hemoglobinemia, visual impairment that's either temporary or permanent, and chemical burns, either kind of an intranasal dermatitis from inhaling it or burns on the skin from spilling the liquid. Oh, cassette cleaner. Thanks, Kevin. And it can cause other uh, symptoms like uh, headaches, um, other things like that. So when you're counseling about poppers, you should uh, counsel patients to not use poppers and PDE5 inhibitors concurrently due to the risk. You should also um, tell patients to use some extra caution if they're on antihypertensives. It can be especially dangerous to mix it with nitrates like uh, isosorbide or nitroglycerin. They should, patients should not allow the liquid to come into contact with their skin. And you should also educate them on signs of met hemoglobinemia and tell them that if they have vision loss or any of the symptoms of met hemoglobin, met hemoglobinemia to go to the ER. Wes, I don't know about whippets. I don't know the uh, like physiology of whippets, but maybe someone else knows and can educate us. Okay, let's see. How am I doing on time? Uh, I'm basically done. So I'm just going to like um, whip through this in like two minutes. Um, I'm just going to talk about some BDSM practices. I'm not going to use any pictures. Maybe this may be traumatic for you. So you can like walk away. Um, but BDSM, it's an umbrella term and includes a wide range of behaviors in sexual contexts. There was a study that estimated that between 40 and 70% of individuals have BDSM related fantasies. Um, but only between 20 and 30% of people have engaged in the behavior. Um, the foundation of BDSM is consent and communication, and any of any BDSM practice in the absence of consent is assault. Um, one uh, type of BDSM practice is erotic asphyxiation, encapsulates a, a wide range of practices and may be referred to as breath play. There's a long history of erotic asphy asphyxiation. It was used for erectile dysfunction apparently at some point in history, um, but it's really dangerous. Uh, people can definitely die this way, especially if they are engaging in autoerotic asphyxiation with no one else present. And some BDSM community spaces ban any um, breath play entirely because of this. So if a patient tells you that they're doing this, um, you know, let them know about the risks, give them some strategies to um, like setting up a kind of emergency plan if something goes wrong, their partner, avoid being inebriated during, um, during asphyxiation and never do uh, engage in autoerotic asphyxiation alone. Always have someone nearby who can step in. Um, and then, yeah, sorry, I'm just like whipping through these real quick because I'm out of time, but uh, fisting, uh, it's the practice of inserting a clenched hand into the vagina or the anus. Um, there's a number of different terms for it. The main risk is mucosal injury. It can be um, as severe as perforation of the vagina or the rectum. There have been case reports of, um, of death due to significant blood loss for, for people who did not seek medical attention and risks may be higher when using uh, drugs or alcohol uh, before sex. Uh, and there also may be a higher 
risk of fecal incontinence with anal fisting. So number of things you can counsel patients about, having the inserting partner wear gloves, uh, using lots of lubrication, not using any numbing agent, um, progressing, uh, having the insertive partner progress very slowly and pull out very slowly. If there's been any surgery of the um, vagina, uterus, or anus, then it may be more risky. And so should counsel patients about that. And excessive bleeding should be a 911 call or a trip to the ER. And then finally, erotic piercing, which even though I'm a doctor, I have like a needle phobia. So this one's like harder for me to talk about, but um, but some people do um, uh, have, uh, they insert needles into the skin as an erotic practice and also as a form of body modification. Uh, main risk, bleeding, infection, including bloodborne illness and cellulitis. Uh, people may have kind of like a syncopal reaction or um, just like really strong reactions after having kind of needles placed. And it may cause scarring, which the person, you know, having the needles put into their skin, they may, they may want that, um, but something that should be counseled about. And some things to improve safety, uh, cleaning the skin, using a sharps container, uh, only using new sterile needles. You can tell uh, patients that they can always um, come in for post-exposure prophylaxis if there's a needle stick injury of the kind of inserting partner. Uh, and then just got to keep the, the site clean and covered as it heals. All right. So now that we've talked about all these things, I'm hoping that there will be some, you know, additional questions that you'll feel comfortable asking about um, when you're taking a sexual history. So uh, things like pleasure of sex and the different opportunities for harm reduction. So here's our like 101 sexual history. And so maybe next time you, you talk to someone about sex, um, you ask, you know, how many partners have you had in the last year? And they say, ah, oh, like just, just my wife. Maybe you can also ask, do you have any concerns about your enjoyment of sex? Do you have any pain during or after sex? Uh, you can, and that can open the door to a number of conversations. And after you ask what genders do your partners identify as, or um, kind of like what body parts do your partners have? You can ask also, do you ever use toys during sex uh, and have some opportunities for harm reduction? And after you ask, you know, do you ever wear condoms during sex? Um, you know, maybe they're always wearing condoms, but you wanna know, there's any kink practices that they feel comfortable sharing. Um, and again, you can maybe feel a little bit more comfortable talking to them about harm reduction. So that's my talk. I know it's a lot, um, but let me know uh, if you have any other questions. And yeah, vaccines are great. And yeah, PrEP is great. You should all feel empowered to prescribe PrEP in your primary care clinics. But yeah, if no one has questions, we should uh, take a break. Awesome. Ava, I must congratulate you on the, the pictures you chose. <laughs> some, some of my searches for pictures were a little I was like, oh no, <laughs> um, but I thought this one was funny. I, I hope you deleted your search. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, I'm probably on like a government list somewhere. <laughs> uh, Anna asked, um, you know, I've never talked to patients about rectal douching, but now that I know, I will start talking to my patients about rectal douching. I will probably recommend um, normal saline. Um which I recognize is expensive, but um, but yeah, that's probably what I would recommend. <laughs> Great, why don't we take a five minute break guys and then we'll um, start back up at 9.55 with Nick Delorius. <laughs> 